Kia ora and welcome to Shared Lunch, brought to you by Sharesies with Business Desk. My name is Helen Matteson and on the programme today we'll be talking the property market, our first for 2024. I'll be talking to our regular commentator, independent economist, Tony Alexander. But before we get started, here's some important information. Investing involves risk. You might lose the money you start with. We recommend talking to a licensed financial advisor. We also recommend reading product disclosure documents before deciding to invest. Everything you're about to see and hear is current at the time of recording. Welcome, Tony. Yep, thanks, Helen, for having us on again. Good to be here. Now, it's a while since we spoke, Tony. A fair bit has happened since then. I do note that even though times are tough, New Zealand is still quite obsessed with the property market. Have you noticed a change in sentiment with the new coalition government being in? Yes, that's an interesting question, you see, because we could see some weakness in a few of the indicators for the housing market ahead of the election, or let's say a, a plateauing, a flattening out after things had shot up during the June quarter, lots of buyers were going into the market, and most of us were thinking, OK, but once we get the election out of the way, then maybe then we'll see more buyers coming back in, all the investors, and you know, things are going to not so much take off again, but have renewed strength. That hasn't really happened. Basically, the key dynamic in the housing market has been that in the June quarter, around the middle of 2023, yep, things shot up, a strong increase in sales and prices, but then basically a bit of a plateauing since about September, August or so, and still some cautious out there. And we did go back into it being a bit of a seller's market for a while, but we are still in a buyer's market. So things have just flattened out a little bit. But like everyone else, I still expect it's going to go up, but a little bit flat for the moment. Now, what about some of the macroeconomic factors? I mean, we do focus here a lot on what's happening, but also that obviously has an influence too, doesn't it? Well, uh, yes, yeah, when people look around them and can see if the economy is looking good or bad, if the commentary is positive or it's negative, it's going to make people, even if they're actively looking at buy and go, yeah, nah, I just want to wait and see what's going to happen. And maybe that's been the case with regard to interest rates, the, that the level of uncertainty there has been pretty extreme for a long time. Um, in fact, since 2007, I would suggest, but we don't want to go right back into all of that, <laughs> that detail. It's a bit of a dog's breath. Breakfast, uh, frankly, but um, people can see that uh, the economy is only growing slowly. Uh, they can see that household spending is actually falling out there, especially per capita. So the key thing the Reserve Bank wants to happen, which will eventually, hopefully, get inflation down, um, consumer spending being crunched, it is being crunched. And jobs growth has uh, slowed down as well. The world economy is looking, it's, it's growing, but it's not necessarily exciting, shall we say. And from that macro point of view, with over 30% of New Zealand's export income derived from China, China's economy isn't performing all that well at the moment. So the macro environment in which the housing market is operating is still a bit challenging. I wouldn't call it necessarily negative, not recessionary, but it's certainly not, oh, crikey, we're growing strongly in New Zealand. Let's buy a house on the back of that. No. Okay, so let's look at some of the market trendsetters. Um, for instance, listings. What, what's happening in that world? Yeah, listings is interesting because uh, let's go back to the middle of 2021. Nationwide volume of listings fell below 14,000. That was 73% decline from 10 years earlier. So that was pretty shocking. Then from the middle of 2021 to the end of 2022, obviously the market's flat, credit crunch, etc. prices falling 18%, listing stocks rose to about 28,000 in December 2022. So lots for people to choose from, and that encouraged, I think, uh, young buyers back into the market, especially uh, through 2023. And the number of listings got down to about 24, 25,000 in the middle of uh, last year, and now we're back up at about uh, just over 27,200. So a few more vendors have come forward. Uh, a few more investors uh, have chosen to step forward into the market as well. I wouldn't call it a wave of listings, like all of a sudden people are going, oh, some of the prices are rising, boom, and dump it on the market. But a key point I would have made uh, pre-election in, in the last one of these was there is a two and a half year queue 
of buyers that is built up and they'll be looking to move into the market. And hopefully I also mention, I guess there's a two and a half year queue of vendors and maybe some of them are going to step forward. And yep, some of them are stepping forward as well. So there is still a good range of choice for buyers out there. So looking at the investors, I wouldn't have thought it was that great. Um, you've got insurances up by about 40%. You've got obviously a relatively high interest rates, a number of other costs. Um, there's possibly some changes happening with the government and the Reserve Bank. It doesn't feel like it is the optimal time, but are you seeing a change there? Uh, for the investors, I guess most of us have been thinking that with the tax changes being made from April 1, 80% of their interest expense can be deducted against their rental income for taxation purposes. And April 1, 2025, that's 100%. To me, uh, deducting 80% from April 1 is, is as good as 100%. So most of us are certainly of the view more investors will come into the market, but the numbers simply don't add up in many cases uh, at the moment. Yes, they can see, uh, I believe, that prices are no longer falling out there, and I think a few are out there looking for, for bargains. But yeah, the insurance costs going through the roof, the maintenance costs, local authority rates. There was a bit in the um, uh, the Wellington Post newspaper the other day showing that Wellington Council is, uh, is predicting uh, rates increases that will add up to about 88% over the next uh, five years. And you're thinking, okay, do I want to own property when one of the key costs of it, local authority rates, is going up and up and up? And so for investors, it's not just what's happened in the past year, costs going up. You've got to think about the future and, and things like um, uh, climate change and, and the insurance becoming more specific to the site as well. So I think a lot of investors, they, they are interested. I've got data there, for instance, from my real estate uh, survey showing that about a net 24% of the real estate agents are seeing more investors. And if we go back six or nine months ago, you know, that, that was appalling. I think I had about a net 70% of them almost a year ago saying, oh, fewer investors in the market. So yeah, some of the investors are back, but they're still going, yeah, nah, I'm just going to wait and see how things will pan out. But the fundamentals are in their favour with a population boom from migration in the past year, interest rates eventually set to fall. You know, I do expect them to move back into the market, but for the moment, they're just sort of not there in great numbers yet. Is that going to make a difference with the debt to income possible changes that the government um, well, the Reserve Bank, sorry, has talked about. I think it would be investors probably who would be um, more likely to be hit by a change in that. Would you agree? Uh, yes, and that's what the Reserve Bank has said as well. So just to, to run through some, some detail there, uh, debt to income, DTIs, the Reserve Bank opened up consultation late in January with a close-off date for the consultation of, I think, March 12 on here's what we're proposing, any ideas? And they said uh, uh, if we decide to go ahead with DTIs, they will become effective in the middle of this year. Well, they've been working on this for a while. The banks have been getting their systems ready, people should anticipate in the middle of this year a DTI regime will be in place and the Reserve Bank have said the regime will be that um, uh, for bank lending to owner occupiers, uh, the total debt, mortgages, credit cards, cannot exceed six times the household gross income, uh, apart from maybe 20% of the loans. So 20% can be above that, but 80% of the loans that banks make have to be less than six times the income for the total debt versus the total income. For investors, it's higher than that. Uh, the banks can lend up to seven times uh, the income of the household. Now, at the moment, only between about 5 to 8% or so of bank lending does actually breach the six times and the seven times rule. So when these rules come in, there'll be no impact, basically. Like, no one's going to be um, affected by it. The impact will come when the frenzy next come a lot, comes along. When FOMO is through the roof and people are looking to buy absolutely anything they can get their hands on. And if we go back to the period from sort of the middle of 2020 into late 2021, at its peak, 40% of lending to investors exceeded seven times their income. At its peak, about 35% of lending to owner-occupiers who were not first-home buyers, um, that exceeded six times income, and 28% at the peak of lending to first-home buyers uh, uh, exceeded six times income. So first of all, yes, first-home buyers will be least affected uh, and investors most affected when the frenzy next comes along. So the Reserve Bank will get the regime in place, not for anything at the moment, but for when uh, uh, things are ballistic, and who knows when that'll be, 26, 2027. 
At the same time, people should note, when the DTIs come in, and I'm 100% assuming middle of this year, the LVRs will ease. Banks will be able to lend a bit more uh, to owner-occupiers uh, where they have less than 20% deposit, and the minimum deposit for investors will fall from 35% down to 30% the uh, price of the uh, of the property. So, yeah, these changes will come along, but the immediate impact, quite frankly, will be positive for young buyers in particular from the middle of this year. Lots of acronyms there, Tony. Let's go back and just unpack the LVR for people too, in case they've just caught that. Yeah, okay. LVR, loan to value ratios, first appeared, I think it was, in 2016. So the uh, basically the minimum deposits is what this uh, is about. If you're looking to buy a house, you need a minimum deposit of uh, 20%. But uh, at the moment, a maximum 15% of the lending banks uh, and individual banks will do can be where the deposit is less than 20% for the uh, owner-occupier. Then, of course, there's going through a government agency and using one of their schemes where things don't don't apply to the same degree. Oh, and let me just note, um, because unless you really read the Reserve Bank's press release and going into the question and answer explanatory bit below, you don't get this information. New builds will be excluded from the debt to income regime. So a bank will be able to lend to somebody for a new build, uh, even if the total debt they're going to end up with does exceed six times their uh, household income or seven times as they're an investor. And also those deals with uh, Kainga Ora, uh, et cetera, uh, they'll be excluded as well. You don't know that unless you go deep down into the nitty gritty. Yeah, once again, for investors to think about. What about house prices? It would appear to me that Auckland seems, as as usual maybe, um, out on a limb. That's perhaps where migration is hitting, where demand is probably the greatest. Um, prices maybe are better there than, than other parts of the country. What, what What's your perspective on this? Yeah, Auckland, I, I have a theory, is quite interesting. There's some, I think there's some stuff going to happen that's sort of hidden at the moment in that Auckland since 2004, uh, not enough houses being built in Auckland. We have the global financial crisis. We pop out of it, and the house construction is still falling. And so Auckland had a shortage. Auckland house prices doubled quickly within three years after the global financial crisis. And then the rest of the country sort of joined in as well. Auckland flattened out for three years from 2016. But from 2012 or 13, Auckland construction really strong. Townhouses are largely all over the show. And at the moment, there's a good supply of property available in uh, Auckland. And so uh, their house prices in Auckland have only increased about 4% from the nationwide turning in the house price cycle um, in June. Basically, Wellington's up about 7%, you know, so it's actually exceeding. But there's a migration boom underway. So Auckland's population in the past year would have grown by more than 3%. And in the coming year, the net migration flow, it's going to ease off a bit, but it's still going to be really large. So Auckland population rising really, really strongly, but house construction is now falling away. Uh, It's difficult to sell stuff off the plan. Uh, The cost of making the purchase relatively high. People are scared because of a lot of media articles about some poor people losing their deposits. So I'm trying to give an economics 101 thing here for the people who understand demand and supply curves. Get yourself a piece of paper. Draw demand and supply curves. Now, move the demand curve outwards there because there's increasing population growth in Auckland. But now, move the supply curve back because you've got uh, decreasing growth in new construction that's falling away quite a bit for 2024 that we're in. See what happens to the prices. Equilibrium. It goes upward eventually that dynamic will show through. And I think eventually we are going to get a period of you know, our performance by Auckland. But it'll just be a timing thing. If Auckland leads the cycle, and it did post-GFC, eventually people look for assets, uh, better prices in other parts of the, uh, of, the, of the country. So that dynamic will be the same this time around. Wellington is interesting because there's just a shortage of listings, shortage of construction. Uh, and uh, it's not as if they're receiving all the migrants or anything or or that Wellington tells a good story around the country with water pipes bursting and all this sort of thing. But uh, that's where the prices are leading, just behind Queenstown Lakes at the moment. Canterbury, prices are up about also 4% since the, the turning, and, and, and good internal migration, I think, of benefit there. Now, Tony, another favourite subject for mortgage holders, obviously, is interest rates. We've got relatively high, for a lot of our memories anyway, um, rates at the moment. And obviously, we've got uh, the Reserve Bank looking at um, 
raising or keeping the same or taking it down, who knows, on the 28th of this month. Just before we jump into where we think things might be headed, given what all the bank economists and likes are saying, in terms of the mortgage book, we've heard lots about a number of um, New Zealanders having their mortgage fixed and that they'll be coming off and there's been a whole lot coming off over the last one to two years. Where are we at with that kind of huge change in terms of people having to, or lots of people having to actually increase their mortgage? Yeah, I think virtually everybody has now rolled off of the really low rates in 2020 through 2021 into something higher, but not everybody has jumped from two and a half, three percent to the seven percent. Some have only gone maybe to a five percent, and now they've got another, you know, one or two year rate renewal to, to do, and so now they're jumping into seven percent. So there are still some left uh, that have that final uh, uh, indignity to be inflicted upon them, um, shall we say? So there, that means. There is still negative cash flow uh, uh, restraint to be applied to the New Zealand economy. Tightening monetary policy, that which has already happened, has not yet completely affected the household spending, growth in the economy and the inflationary pressures. And that's one reason I don't buy into a view that there are two more rate increases left by the Reserve Bank. In fact, I don't think they will increase uh, again. The core inflation measures that they look at, some of them are falling away at a faster pace since their peak of about a year ago than they increased on the way up. So I look at that, I look at the fact the economy is weaker than they an anticipated. So yeah, I, I think the main thing is the Reserve Bank is not going to give any easing signal uh, for a long time um, and will bat back against uh, any view that suddenly reappears in the market of, oh, there's another easing com coming along. But yeah, I personally don't think there will be another one or two uh, increases out there. But yeah, there won't be relief for the uh, mortgage borrowers until maybe late this year. And then the second part of my, my view would be, I think the Reserve Bank probably have over-tightened. After all, that's what they were aiming for. They said, uh, we're going to run the risk of over-tightening in order to get inflation down from, well, 7.3%. So there could be some decent rate cuts, maybe 2025, not so much this year. So Tony, you don't agree with ANZ predicting there could even be as many as two rate rises before May. You you definitely thinking what the Reserve Bank will probably hold for a while? I think they'll hold for a while. I'll think they'll be still be really staunch um, on that. I'm not expecting a, a cut uh, in the first half of the, this year. I look at things like um, uh, price business plans to increase their selling prices. That comes out, in fact, of the ANZ's business uh, outlook survey they do each month. Ever since inflation got down to around 2% in 1992, on average, a net 25% of businesses have said, ah, I'm going to put my prices up in the next 12 months. That's been stuck at about 50% for almost 12 months now. So businesses are still saying, we're going to put our prices up. So I look at that and it says to me, if I was sitting there running the Reserve Bank, I would not want to be sending an easing signal as yet. And I'd be prepared to stay staunch, but then maybe play catch up with rate cuts if it was necessary in 2025. So no, I don't agree with the um, with the A and Z view uh, there. But um, what what the heck? You know, there's a, a market in views out there, just as there is for who's going to win a horse race or a, or a game with the Warriors in the rugby league. <laughs> yeah, because I think the share market has actually factored in um, one change. So it'll be interesting to see what does actually transpire in the end. Yep, yep, yep. It's always uncertain, and the Reserve Bank likes it that way. They don't want uh, the markets to be 100% certain on what's going to happen, and they like to shock them every now and then. So I think there will eventually be an easing shock somewhere down the track, but like way down the track, not in the next few months. Yeah. And how are borrowers responding to this uncertain environment? What we've seen happen over the past uh, year to year and a half is that people initially were fixing a bit two to three years, and then it was 18 months, was really popular last year. People are pretty much jumping into one year as the longest for most of them, and lots of six-month fixing at the moment to just sort of ride the rates down when eventually they fall. I think what people haven't realised is it's not as if the rates are suddenly going to bottom out when their six-month rate return, uh, matures or the six months after that. We may not reach the cyclical bottom for these rates for, who knows, two or three years. So people are going to have to be busy refixing for a while. So six months, yeah, you're going to face a choice every six months on what to do for possibly up to two years. And would it be right in thinking that 
you're probably better to get a mortgage broker to help because it would appear that the rates that are advertised by banks, particularly for those lower um, terms, six months, one year, they're not quite the same what's advertised on the billboards. Um, so it's a bit of negotiation, a bit of stuff going on behind the scenes. What's your view on that? Yeah, I think it does pay to use a mortgage broker because each bank is different. Each bank has a different sort of portfolio, uh, different risk, dis different measures of risk, different appetite for, for what they want to take on board. They each have different criteria for the expenses that they will factor in, the proportion of rent for investors, the rental income they will, will factor in. And so while you may have a bank you've been with there for you know, a great number of years, naturally that might be where you walk in first first of all. Uh, but you know, I'd go through a broker because they could say, well, actually, you're probably going to get a deal, better deal from this other crowd over, over there uh, because they're not quite so worried about expenses or having as much uh, uncommitted monthly income as is the case uh, for for another one. So it's it's just to shop around and the mortgage brokers get paid by the banks to shop around on your behalf. Tony, we've talked a lot probably about residential property, whether you're an investor or you're a first home buyer and the like. What about commercial property? I've sort of seen here in Wellington anyway that it appears that there's some smaller developments up for grabs, um, more than we've ever seen. And they're not, so they're not huge, huge sites or buildings where, you know, the likes of you and me wouldn't have the money to, to invest. But are you noticing any changes with, with commercial property? Commercial property is always fairly difficult for us macroeconomists because it's it's always so site-specific, town-specific. Generally, the overall overriding thing for commercial property around the world is that valuations are coming down as a result of, first of all, the increase in interest rates over the past you know, two, two and a half years. So that's been factored into like 25% discounts, uh, uh, cuts in the valuations of property in, in some parts of Australia, America, etc. It's causing some issues for one or two uh, regional banks in America again. So there's downward revaluations going on and mixed in all of that is more solidity to a feeling of, well, actually, people don't want to use this space as much as before because of increased working from home. So there, there are those sort of two negative things that are flowing through there. And yet at the same time, we have uh, a lot of occupants are moving to the higher quality accommodation. And there's actually a shortage of that. Uh, Auckland, even in Christchurch as well, if somebody decides, oh, we love Christchurch, let's shift our 100 staff down to Christchurch, you may need to build your own office building down there because the space simply isn't available. Wellington, there's a lot of seismic uh, problems that you have to take into account uh, down there, standards to be met, and that's going to be an issue by the looks of it for quite some time. But there's a lot of money still sitting out there looking for a home to go to. So I'm in no doubt at all that there will still be some pretty good demand for those more bite size uh, properties that an individual investor can gear themselves into, not so much your 12, you know, 20 storey buildings, etc. Uh, we rely a bit more on the international purchases, the, uh, the fund managers. But yeah, I, I think demand is still relatively uh, strong. People have got used to assessing the earthquake uh, regimes that are relevant uh, for making those purchases. And once interest rates start falling again, like one day, then I would expect more of that money to be starting to look again at the commercial property uh, uh, sector. And we shouldn't forget, you know, when we're talking commercial property, uh, I've sort of made out like it's only um, offices. Retailing, it's like at some point, surely that's going to bottom out. People will start spending again. And so then the retail demand will be out out, out there. Um, and of course, on the farming side, uh, New Zealand has a strong farming sector. And there there's always seems to be some good demand from the investors out there for you know farming-related uh, property as well. Obviously, to buy property, you need to have a reasonable income. What are you seeing in terms of employment trends? I mean, unemployment and wage growth, that type of thing, I mean, that usually has an effect on the property market. Yeah, the wages growth is interesting. You see, in Australia, wages growth has only been about 4% the past year. So in Australia, for the past three and a half years, wages growth has been less than inflation, less than the cost of living. So there's a squeeze on household spending over there. However... In New Zealand, wages growth has been about 25% over the past three, three and a half years, at the same time as the cost of living, excluding interest payments, has gone up by about 20%. So we've continued to have real wage growth in New Zealand. That's a bit of a problem for inflation, you see, because the Reserve Bank, to get inflation down, needs to see wages growth slowing. And the measure I look at was still up about 6.5% in the past year. It's still too high. The increase uh, consistent with low inflation since 1992 has been about 3.3% uh, per annum. But 
wages growth is happening out there. And that's one reason from 12 months ago, I was saying for the young buyers, well, actually, there's going to be a good flow of them into the market because, well, they're not already paying interest payments. So rising interest rates don't uh, hit them. And yet they're getting really good wages growth uh, out there, exceeding the increase in their cost of living. And so we see strong you know, demand from, from the young people. Uh, wages growth is slowing. There will be further slowing uh, in it. Uh, but inflation is now falling at the same time. We're down from the peak of 7.3% to what are we at, 4.7% now. Going to be maybe below 3% come the end of the, of this year. So working out these equations can become a little bit uh, difficult. The labour market itself, the New Zealand Institute of Economic Research have been doing a quarterly survey since the 1960s. Uh, they ask businesses a range of questions and one of them is, are you finding it easy or hard to get labour, skilled and unskilled? And the response, the latest one, has been that uh, businesses are saying, you know, it's the easiest to find skilled and unskilled people, actually, in about 14 years. So I look at that and a few other measures falling job ads, and it says to me, actually, the labour market has really flattened out. That didn't come through in the household labour force survey uh, that caused you know, a 0.3% rise in the swap rates recently, and some people predicting interest rates going up. When jobs growth was 0.4% in the December quarter, the Reserve Bank figured only 0.2%, and the unemployment rate only went from 39 to 4%, where it was pre-pandemic. The Reserve Bank had, had expected 4.2%. I mean, the labour market, by that measure, is stronger than the Reserve Bank factored in, so hence some of the monetary policy worries. Me, I think the, the particular set of data um, is a bit of a rogue result, and uh, the other indicators show that it's, it's easing off. So the labour market, all up, I would suggest will not be supportive of the housing market over the next 12 to 15 months. But interest rates uh, coming down, migration boom, those things will offset that effect. So Tony, in terms of buying at the moment, are you sort of saying that it's mainly first home buyers that are in the market? given the conditions? Well, if we look at the data from Core CoreLogic, they, uh, they show that about 27% of house purchases are being made by first-home buyers. It's a record proportion out there. And like I've been saying for the past 12 months, that's understandable in terms of they've got jobs, good wages growth, built-up deposits. They don't have investors to compete uh, uh, against. Credit criteria have eased a little bit um, as well. Lots of listings to to choose from. So they're dominating the market and they are still the main movers out there. The investors are looking. They're definitely out there looking, but they're just a bit hesitant to buy. Other owner occupiers, those who will look to buy then sell or sell then buy, uh, they're still just sort of sitting still just a, a bit for the moment. So uh, the main movers are still the first home buyers. And at some point, their percentage will diminish as the others get back into the market. And I guess I'm expecting that before the end of this uh, of this year. Yeah, good point. When will that frenzy that you talked about happen? Um, I have heard that investors may be looking to come back a bit sooner. Obviously, with those debt-to-income ratios possibly changing, that could you know, create some momentum there. Well, what do you think? Um, yeah, from the DTI regime coming in in the middle of this year, it's 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 not going to do anything for as far as the investors encourage or restrain them. It's going to restrain every body or lots of borrowers when the next absolute frenzy comes around. Now that may not be for a long period of time. That, that may not happen for two or three years, quite frank, frankly. So it's it's not much point think, thinking about that. Like I say, I think the investors are definitely sitting there, but it's going to take, I think, a one percent fall in interest rates before they actually move forward as a block um, and that may not actually happen until uh, maybe even early you know 2025 there's already some early movers out there have been buying for the past six or nine months because they're paying cash so the interest expense deductibility was no issue for them uh, uh, anyway at the very lead indicator would be some developers are picking up land in anticipation of developments 18 to 24 months because with construction falling away but underlying demand rising, um, at some point the demand for new builds will come back. That's a story for 2025, 2026. But there are just some leading indicators of people starting to set themselves up for increased demand generally for, for new dwellings um, and for that development land 25-26. Yeah, because we've talked about who's in the market buying, but what about the kind of stock that is there now and what we will see? Are you thinking that there will be more townhouses and the like coming on because that's typically what 
new builds have been previously anyway. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just the change in the New Zealand housing market. Um, about half of the houses being constructed nationwide would be still standalone houses, but that's predominantly in the in the regions. Uh, we do have we have had for the past few months the total number of consents for townhouses and apartments, I think mixed in there, um, exceeding the number of standalone houses. Um, whether that just blips back the other way again temporarily, I don't know. But hey, where a lot of people want to live, other people are already living there and have been doing so since. 1850s or 60s or something or other. Everybody wants to live uh, where they can minimise the transport times, etc. cetera, you know, near the centre of the city. And it's just not possible. Other beggars have already got the, got the land. So hence the land price pressure, but hence also the good demand, which will come back again. Uh, good pre-sales, buying off the plan for the three, four, whatever, five-storey um, townhouse apartment uh, developments in the sort of inner, inner circles uh, there, as well as the more far-flung suburbs. Yep, we're intensifying in New Zealand and that's sort of it from here on out, quite frankly. And I suppose with climate change and not perhaps being able to get insurance in some of the more coastal areas and, and other areas that are, are no longer thought to be conducive for building, that may also add to that demand or pressure, if you like. Well, you would certainly expect so. And look at the way people have sort of expressed real surprise at the fact that since uh, Cyclone Gabriel last year, there's about over, what was it, over a thousand consents still issued for houses to be built in floodplains. It's ridiculous. It is wrong. Uh, something needs to, to be done in that regard. Um, and I guess the councils maybe just to step forward and say, sorry, these are no build uh, uh, zones. And the trigger, as we've all been saying for a number of years now, with our rising awareness of A, climate change, and B, the implications of climate change, the trigger is probably going to more be the insurance company say, sorry, we aren't insuring anything in that basin. It's just way too risky. Uh, if we price a premium, it's just going to be so absolutely huge. Um, no, nobody's going to be interested. It's a bit like buying you know, your, your Ferrari, your big luxury car. You think, I can just stretch myself, for some people, 400 grand. Yeah, go and check out your insurance premiums and go and check out the cost of a new windscreen or something like that. Oops. Um, anyway, the insurance, I think, will be the trigger for a greater pullback from a lot of those areas uh, down the track, both here and overseas. Tony, one question about people's portfolios. I mean, property in New Zealand is a mainstay if you can afford it and if you're perhaps the right age and you've got the right assets behind you. Are you seeing any changes in the mix people um, are thinking about given you know, the, the situation we have with property at the moment? Property tends to be quite cyclical. I don't think we have the same sort of cycles we used to have in the share market, as in going back to the 70s, the 80s. There were some there were some doozies, obviously, back there. I think there is a steadier, long-term, calmer, what can you say, more professional approach to the one's you know, share component of one's portfolio. It's like, this is a long-term focus, um, and I'm just going to keep beep. Beep, beavering away there, I might change a little bit from a, a high risk fund to low risk. I might move into ETFs, a little bit of experimentation here, here and there. Um, I view that, I guess, as relatively steady. And I think that's one of the things we were getting out of our, our regular survey there, which used to be monthly, but yeah, things were changing aggressively enough on a monthly basis. So hence why we've gone to um, quarterly. But for the, it's the housing, which is more the cyclical thing, up and up and down. People saying, I'm going to maybe maintain my exposure on the share market there. But just for a little while, I might, in fact, allocate some new money to build up a bit of a deposit um, to go towards uh, to riding this housing cycle upward for the next three years, something like that. It always comes along. And because of the gearing, uh, banks generally aren't going to lend people money to, to gear themselves into uh, share purchases. Uh, but of course, that's part of their business for buying uh, uh, property. And so there is that gearing up element, which means once the sh housing market really gets some obvious momentum to it, then it'll be moving. But I don't think it's really going to come much at the cost of, oh, the share market is going to go down because all this money's moving from the share market into the housing market. That's not really the way the dynamic works. Just one market we haven't touched on, Tony, is f renting. There's a lot of people obviously renting. Um, what, what's been happening there? Yeah, renting is interesting because that's sort of the spear point of this population, this migration boom. And I've got a uh, monthly survey I do of existing residential property investors there, for instance. And as I've noted, right at the end of 2022, I had a net 8% of the investors saying, oh, it's hard to get a good tenant. 
the latest survey, I'm going to do a new one any day, but the one just before Christmas, I think it was about a net 29% of the investors saying it's easy to get a good tenant. So that's where, first of all, the population boom um, shows up. You can pick and choose as an investor who you want to uh, let in there. Then it moves into greater increase in rents um, in terms of well, how my costs are increasing for the insurance, the maintenance, local authority rates. I need to make a rent increase. I don't like doing it, but goodness me, every man and his dog wants to rent my house, um, and my flat, etc. So I'm going to put them up 8 10%, that sort of thing. That's the next step to come along, which is something the Reserve Bank will keep an eye on from an inflation point of view, we've got to remember. And once we get the rentals moving a bit more, then I think the investors will go, oh, these numbers are looking better when they combine that with the interest rates going down. So to me, a couple of the key triggers for the investors to boom, really step forward are not there yet. The stronger rental increases uh, and the interest rates going down at the same time. We're not quite there yet. One thing too, Tony, I wondered about is the, is the holiday holiday property market, the batch that the Kiwis love to have and, and for a lot of people is now not affordable. Are you seeing any changes there? I mean, the idea obviously would be that you would have someone in it a bit more often to, to pay all of those costs that you keep talking about that are going up. Um, that's not always possible. I mean, is that something that's changing in our psyche? That's a difficult one to figure out. We generally lack data on specifically the holiday market. You can't really say, oh, let's just look at Taupo or let's just look at Queenstown. No, no, no. The dynamics are are totally different from that. There's a negative impact running through uh, of uh, for small, medium sized enterprises. People are running their businesses, maybe make good profits, get aspirational, get the um, uh, holiday home uh, purchase. Well, they're they're relatively tight. The cash flows are tight. The IRD is catching up on pandemic bills, etc. And so that market, I think, will not really be doing much buying of the holiday property in the near future. But offsetting that, of of course, is the fact the international tourists are coming back. So there is money to be made by whacking your uh, uh, property on one of these, you know, uh, platforms. Uh, it, 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 etc. And also with the ageing population, there's a whole cohort of people out there um, not affected at all by interest rates are going up, thinking about where do I want to you know, either retire to or someplace we want to spend half our lives are, are at. And uh, these are the sort of people who will think, you know, I don't care if I can't even get insurance on this place because it's going to be underwater in 50 years. I'll be dead within 50 years, if not within 25. So, And this is a phenomenon. And, and they'll think, okay, well, we might as well purchase it that there. So you've got that group of people still making some purchases. And so when I try somehow to blend all of that together, it says to me, I don't really have a negative view on the holiday home uh, market just because the interest rates are high and some of the aspirational buyers just have to step back for cash flow reasons at the moment. I still think it's going to be still reasonably well supported, but nothing is jumping out to me and saying, oh, this market's really going to go up. For that, I think your combination, you need a combination again of the interest rates going down and the economy really growing more strongly and spare profits with people looking to do something with that money. Uh, no, we're not there, not there. That may become as a story for 2026. So Tony, we've covered a fair bit today. I'm just thinking, looking ahead then, if, what, what would you say would be sort of things for people looking to buy, whether they're an investor, whether they're a first home buyer or the like, what would you say they need to consider in the next, you know, six months or so. A whole range of things to consider. Uh, Project forward into what your insurance costs may be. You've seen about a 30% increase. I've had a 27% increase in the past year, and I thought, I'm going to shop around. And then I thought, no, I bet everybody's gone up, so I didn't. I just grin and, 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 and pay it. Think about what may happen to that over the next few years if you're looking to be in your property at least seven years or so. And local authority rates, have a look at what your council is projecting as their rates increases for the next few years and go, well, actually, are we going to be able to even afford this place? Because these expenses are going to grow far more than my wages, my salary in the near future. So give more thought to that than I'd suggest we've ever had to do in the past 200 years, quite frankly, in the in this country. Um, when the interest rates come down, there'll be more buyers coming forward. So keep that in your back of your mind when you're going, yeah, nah, we'll wait, we'll wait, we'll wait. At some point, uh, everyone else is going to jump into the market, so watch out for that one. That's mainly a message for young buyers. You've still got a window of opportunity, I think, to make a purchase before the investors especially move back into, into the market. I think you've still got a few more months uh, left 
maybe another six months beyond what I thought was the case. I'm sure last one of these housing commentaries, I would have said, I think your your, your market runs out uh, in the first quarter of this year. No, I think you've now got through just into the start, maybe this after the middle of this year, for instance. In terms of any other dynamics out there, I've mentioned about the migration, and this, this can be a difficult one to figure out because uh, you think, well, most migrants are probably not able to buy a house for, for a while, but uh, and foreigners, of course, can't buy unless they're coming out of Australia or, or out of uh, 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 Singapore. But we do have more occupations where if you move in as a migrant into New Zealand, you can buy a house straight away. Uh, there's a whole bunch where you can buy a house after a year's time. This migration boom has been going for over a year. And so we do now have uh, more migrants, in fact, going into the uh, market. And there's one of the measures I was looking at, I think it might have been possibly the, the quarterly data on property transfers from Stats New Zealand and an increasing proportion of property purchases are being made by people who are residents. They're not citizens, but an increasing proportion who have residency. So it's like that's a slowly growing market out there with maybe a little bit of a spurt in the next 12 to 24 months. So just keep an eye on, on that one. It's not foreigners buying, uh, but these aren't New Zealand citizens, but they've got res residency. And that's, that's just another thing to add into the mix for the next uh, two to three years. And on that construction, is there any predictions on when that will start coming back the other way? Because I know obviously Fletchers have had their woes, but it isn't really just to do with that. It's, they've got other issues going on. Yeah, I don't know anything about Fletchers or any individual uh, construction companies. The, the circumstances vary tremendously. I see this in New Zealand and I see it on the Gold Coast in Australia. I, I keep an eye on as well. Things fall over and you go... Yeah, I wonder why the heck that, that, that happened. Um, my expectation is that the construction will be falling for all of this year into the first half of 2025, but then coming back up again because that combination of population growth, uh, falling uh, interest rates, uh, the investors coming back into the, uh, into the market there, house prices rising and the equation starts to shift. All the commentary at the moment is it seems quite expensive to build. I think maybe it's cheaper to buy an existing property. That dynamic will flip back the other way in 2025. So when I've chatted with some builders, some property developers, I'm, my message has been this year negative, but you want, want to get yourself ready for that demand coming back in again at some point in 2025. And clearly, I, I don't really have a good feel of, are we talking about January 2025 or December of 2025? There's no model can tell you that. But to me, this is just a cyclical temporary decline in house construction nothing remotely like happened after the global financial crisis or in the second half of the 1970s when things absolutely plummeted it's not that at all thanks everyone for tuning in today you can watch shared lunch on youtube or you can listen wherever you get your podcasts leave us a five star rating and tell us what you'd like to hear next we have a special offer for Sharesies investors from Business Desk. If you use the promo code SHEDLUNCH2024, you'll get $100 off our annual subscription. The offer only applies to new Business Desk subscribers, can only be used once per subscriber, and can't be used with any other discounts. Enjoy the rest of your week. 